Broadcasting from Baltimore, Maryland, and all around the world, you're listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. Tune in each Thursday on iTunes for the latest episodes of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sign up for the free show archive at InvestorHour.com. Here is your host, Dan Ferris. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, a value investing service published by Stansberry Research. Let's do the rant. Okay, so this week, uh, I want to talk about something I really love because I have to tell you, since I took over the podcast, in the very beginning, we got a few negative Nancys who didn't like me. But then after that, the feedback has been universally wonderful. And it just struck me today as I read through more lovely feedback by our listeners that I'm re- this is like the greatest job I've ever had in my life. I get to just sit here and talk about all the stuff I love, and you guys are loving it. So this is like a giant love fest. <laughs> it's wonderful. So one of the things I love is books. I'm surrounded by them in my office here, hundreds and hundreds of them. And I always mention them, you know, during the rants and the podcast. And I thought I would just talk about some of them because a standard question I get is, you know, what should I, what should I read? I want to learn more about investing. What should I read? And I always recommend Howard Marks, The Most Important Thing. And I recommend uh, chapters eight and 20 of The Intelligent Investor by Ben Graham. And, and a bunch of other like really good financial books to start off with. But there's a presentation actually that I hope to give um, this fall at our conference in Las Vegas that will focus on non-financial books that I think investors really need to read. Okay, these are like must read, but they're non-financial books for investors. Um, because they just have the kind of ideas that investors need to be exposed to. There's just no other way to say it than that. These are ideas investors need. So I thought today I would kind of give a little preview of that. And, you know, I just, like I said, I love, I love what I'm doing here and I love communicating with you. And actually, you know, before the fall, I'm going to be in Vancouver at the Sprott Conference in July. And the Sprott Conference is a wonderful event. I go there every year. And it's I feel like it's kind of a slightly more under the radar event because it focuses on mining companies. But it really is, you know, the single best investment conference ba- focused on mining companies in the world. Um, one reason for that is that Sprott goes to the trouble of like, they don't let just any mining company exhibit and speak there at the conference. They're actually picky. You have to be good enough to get in. And I'm telling you, in the mining industry, that eliminates a lot of folks from getting in because the mining industry is loaded with, you know, scammy, crappy companies that you don't want anything to do with. And I mean, they're still risky, right? Mining is still risky, but they've gone to the trouble of just focusing on the exhibiting companies that they want at the conference, you know, things that they want their attendees and their investors um, to focus on and be exposed to. Um, And, you know, I've been going to this thing for years and I never fail to learn something. And I always find, I'll tell you what, I, I always find a company that I hadn't thought about before that I wind up putting real money into. Um, you know, may, might be a small amount because they're really risky, but but it's true. I always find one. So anyway, that's the Sprott Vancouver Investment Conference um, in July, and I'll be I'm speaking there. I'll, I'll give two two talks there: one in the main um, the main hall, and then one in one of the little breakout sessions. To get your seat at the conference, you can register at SprottConference.com. That's S P R O T T Conference.com. And you can get a special discount for listening to the podcast if you use the promo code Ferris100. Ferris100. And look, if you see me at the conference, by all means, come over and say hello if you see me in the hallways. And I'm really looking forward to it. Having said that, let's talk about books for non-finance investors. Now, of course, let's let's just kind of consolidate. We had um, Albert Laszlo Barabasi on the program I told you his book, The Formula, The Universal Laws of Success, was one of my favorite books 
probably the best book I've read in the last year easily. I couldn't put it down. These are real laws of success that are, you know, it's not like self-helpy sort of airy-fairy kind of laws. They're scientific laws. Like Laszlo says, they're like the law of gravity uh, because he's got all the math to back it up. And I thought I would read you each law. There are five of them. The first one is performance drives success, but when performance can't be measured, networks drive success. The second law is performance is bounded, but success is unbounded, right? And the example there is Tiger Woods. So Tiger Woods golfing is like just a little bit better than everybody else, uh, but his success is a lot more because once you're the number one guy, that's who the one everybody focuses on, right? The third law is previous success times fitness equals future success. I don't want to get into that one. Read the book. <laughs> the fourth law, while team success requires diversity and balance, a single individual will receive credit for the group's achievements. I think that speaks for itself. The fifth law is the one that uh, you recall in the interview, we said this kind of gives us hope. Fifth law is with persistence, success can come at any time. So those are the five laws. Read the book. It, it, I, I feel like it's changed my life. It's really a fantastic book. Now, he has two other books. Called, one is called Linked, and the other one is called Bursts. And these are all based on his research in network science. If the topic of networks interests you, there's another book called The Seventh Sense by Joshua Cooper Ramo. And that seventh sense is just to see the world the way Laszlo sees it in terms of networks. Now, there's another book that I haven't read yet called The Square and the Tower. And that too is about networks. It's by Neil Ferguson, the guy who wrote The Ascent of Money, who is a, a great historian. We got to have him on the program at some point. And just in the same, um, in the same vein, uh, it's not about networks, but I think it's germane to the topic. There's a book by a guy named Derek Thompson who wrote for the Atlantic Magazine uh, who writes for the Atlantic Magazine now. The book is called Hitmakers, and it's got a wonderful story about the people who became those first, I think there were seven uh, impressionist painters, and the manner in which they became basically a big hit. And then he goes and gives other more modern examples of people who became a big hit. And I don't want to spoil it for you, read it. It's it's fascinating how these people became famous. And like, he, he busts certain myths, like the idea of word of mouth isn't exactly what you think it is. Okay. This next book is really special. I said the formula was the best book. Hmm. Okay. So maybe a close second and, and one that has arguably been more impactful to me just in the near term here is a book called How We Learn by Benedict Carey. I think I've mentioned it once or twice. This book is awesome. I don't know how else to say it. So when I was studying music in college, um, my teacher said, you know, how much are you going to practice your guitar every day? And I said, well, I was thinking three or four hours. He said, that's good. Because I was a music, I was a performance major. So he's like, okay, you got to practice a lot. He said, but don't do it all at once space it out during the day. It's better to have two or three practice sessions of an hour or so than it is to have one long one. And that technique is covered in the book. It's called spacing. You're spacing out your practice sessions, your study sessions. And this goes for anything you want to learn, anything. And there are other things. Um, I remember when I I was going for, uh, I was managing other people's money for a very short period of time. Not a pleasant experience, I have to say. And I wanted to get a, I think it was a Series 65 license. So you got to take a test for that. And, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that half of it's really pretty forgettable. Uh, and I thought, God, how am I going to study for this thing? This is a drag. I don't want to, I don't want to take up too much time with this. So I did one of the techniques in this book, unbeknownst to me, it was, you know, I didn't know about the book back then because it wasn't out, but it's called testing, you know, and so all I did was there were, I, I got a hold of these practice tests, I, there were six of them, and I just read through the material once and did a practice test, and then I graded it, got a bunch wrong, went back, studied all the stuff I got wrong, did another practice test, and did that six times, and I passed the test. 
and it was not hard at all. Um, so testing is really good. And I wound up, that's another thing that you wind up doing as a musician, right? You're constantly testing to see if you can play the piece you're working on. So you sit down and you start playing it and you play from the beginning to the end. You're like, well, I made 10 mistakes and you go back and try to fix your 10 mistakes. And there are other, other techniques. Interleaving is an interesting one. Um, that's when you practice different skills in the same practice session. Again, a typical thing that a musician does um, and it can be applied in other disciplines. Fascinating book, fantastic read, really easy, breezy read, very well written. The guy's a professional writer. He writes for the New York Times. He writes about science for the New York Times. How bad could it be? You know, and it's very good. Um, so How We Learn by Benedict Carey, highly, highly recommend. Okay, so for the next two are by Doug Casey and John Hunt. They're novels. They're fiction books. One is called Speculator and one is called Drug Lord. I've known Doug Casey, I think, since about 1998. And since just about since then, he's been telling me about this series of books that he's going to write one day. And I thought, boy, he's, you know, I just thought, well, this is one of those things people talk about. They're never going to do it. And he's doing it. And the first two books are out and they're fantastic because Doug is a very smart guy. He got a guy named John Hunt, who's an actual novelist, <laughs> to help him. So the books read like really exciting adventure novels, but they're loaded with incredible ideas that are highly valuable. Um, some of the ideas are about politics, but a lot of them, especially in the book Speculator, are about how to think about how you participate in financial markets. I don't want to ruin any of it for you, you know, because there's some mystery and stuff in the books. But I will tell you that two of the characters are based on Doug himself. One is like the young Doug and one is like the older, wiser Doug. Um, highly recommend those. Doug Casey, Speculator and Drug Lord. And and he's the, the series that he was telling me about, that he, the first one is Speculator and the next one is Drug Lord and the next one is Assassin. I believe the one after that is Warlord and then Antichrist. And so these are occupations. And he, the guy starts out as a young man. He's a speculator and the government steals his money and screws him up. And so he becomes a drug lord. And he doesn't sell like, you know, nasty drugs to kill people. But he does sell drugs illegally because the FDA won't approve them. Then, you know, they screw him up with that. And then, he be, then he's going to become an assassin and, you know, they're going to screw that up for him, then he's going to become a warlord, et cetera, et cetera. This is a guy who, you know, he'll basically spend his life um, pursuing these occupations that are uh, maligned, and, and he'll end up as the Antichrist. I have no idea what the occupation of Antichrist entails, none whatsoever. Okay, so uh, that's Speculator and Drug Lord. Um, and, and let's just finish up with um, a couple of titles. One is Humilitas, Humilitas by John Dixon. And it's about the attribute of humility, which I think is very important for investors. And it goes into this whole bit about uh, ancient cultures based on honor and shame, which is a little different. You know, we, <laughs> if, you, if you watch TV at all and you watch the news and you, you pay attention to news, there's not a lot of honor and shame <laughs> There doesn't appear to be a lot of shame, although we do have our version of it, don't we? Because you get these people having to apologize for, you know, sometimes not doing anything particularly very, very wrong. So we've sort of perverted that idea, I think. Anyway, Humilitas is a good book for investors. It teaches you about the attribute of humility. A short, really good read, too. Last, I'll mention the genius biographies of Walter Isaacson. Look, these are 600 pages. You can't do a great biography without, you know, taking up 600 pages. And it's um, Steve Jobs, Einstein, Ben Franklin, and Leonardo da Vinci we discussed last week on the show with Chris Pavese. These are, I can't say enough about them. They're incredible books. The Steve Jobs book and, and um, I think to a certain extent uh, the Franklin and Einstein books, they read like novels. They're incredible. Uh, and they do a wonderful job of kind of showing you what these people were about. And they go into their ideas. There's all whole sections explaining Einstein's scientific ideas. And, um, you know, Leonardo's 
ideas and it, it, they're, they're well worth your time. Okay, so those are some of my list of essential non-financial books for investors. Okay, it's time to find out what's new in the world. Uh, earlier this week, the first thing I saw when I when I got out of bed and turned on the the news was that Ross Perot had died at the age of 89. Um, you probably remember him. He ran for president a while back, and uh, he was a very successful guy. Early in his career, he was a uh, top IBM salesman, you know, selling computers when computers were these giant machines, right? Uh, and he noticed that the customers were not using, they were spending huge amount of times actually not using their machines. And of course, IBM didn't want to hear about that because they just wanted to sell more machines. But he basically made a fortune um, helping people use their their computers more efficiently, you know. So he would sell the, he, he found a way to sell the time on these computers and and did a bunch of other things and created a company called EDS that was, uh, early on involved in Medicare and Medicaid and and helping the government be a little more efficient, which we could all, which we, we were probably all grateful for uh, or not. I don't know. Maybe you don't want those things to be more efficient. Maybe you want them to go away. Um, but a story um, that I want to tell about Ross Perot is in the book, I Love Capitalism by Ken Langone. Uh, Ken Langone is one of the five founders of Home Depot. He was the banker, actually in the beginning. And so early on, when the, when the guys got fired from their job, um, Bernie Marcus and um, Arthur Blank and, and, and another fellow whose name escapes me for the moment, got fired from their job at a company called Handy Dan. Um, Ken Langone said, don't worry, we're going to start a new company. And he went to Ross Perot to try to raise the money. And they were all set and Perot was going to give him two million bucks. And then Perot asks the one guy, he says, what kind of car do you drive? And the guy says, you know, this is like the mid, this is like 1978 or 79 or something like that. And he says, I drive a 1972 Pontiac. And he says, great. And then he asked the other guy, uh, he said, what, what kind of car do you drive? And the guy said, you know, I drive a 1973 Cadillac. And Perot's eyebrows shot up and he says, Cadillac? My guys drive Chevrolets. They don't drive Cadillacs. And so, you know, that then Bernie Marcus, um, he, he's, he got Ken Langone and he said, can we go talk for a minute? And he says, you know something, this guy, we're going to have him own 70% of our company. And he's busting my chops about owning an old Cadillac because the car had like 100,000 miles on it. It wasn't some new fancy car. And he said, you know, what else is he going to drive me nuts about? Let's get the hell out of here. Uh, and you know, they had a little argument. They were like, you nuts. The guy's about to give us $2 million. And then Marcus, uh, came back and said, you know, I don't want to have this guy as my controlling shareholder. And he says, here's a quote for the book. He says, in fact, I'd rather starve to death than have this guy as a partner. And that was the end of Ross Perot's involvement, uh, in Home Depot. Um, but you know, interesting guy. And, uh, Gone at the Age of 89, and a great book, by the way, I Love Capitalism, really easy to read, fun, extremely well-written, great story after story after story told by Ken Langone. Um, there's another one you can add to the list, right? <clears throat> so I just want to talk about Starbucks, uh, which is a company that I have revealed that we've recommended in Extreme Value. It's done extraordinarily well the last year. It's up like 70%. Um, just since last uh, August when we covered it. And it's a great business. It's a wonderful business. But they have these episodes every now and then that kind of speak to their sort of left coast culture, you know. And recently what happened was uh, an employee at one of the stores in Tempe, Arizona, asked six police officers, six of them, I mean, the guy had guts walking up to six cops and asking them to leave or move out of a certain customer's line of sight because the customer said he didn't feel safe because of the big police presence. Now, I have to say, I'm 
ever so mildly sympathetic to that viewpoint. But this strikes me as a little silly. I don't know. Maybe I'm not that guy. Maybe he was beat up by the police at one point in his life. I don't know. But just going through with this and having, you know, saying something to the manager and the manager or employee, whoever it was, asking six police officers to leave the store or move out of this guy's line of sight just struck me as a little bit crazy, kind of a sign of the times. And the the latest headline is that the uh, Starbucks has apologized, you know, after an employee. I just think that this is a little bit crazy. I, I said earlier, I was talking about the book Humilitas um, and that we we are not so familiar anymore with the ancient cultures based on honor and shame. And maybe the, maybe we just have such a different version of it um, that that I'm failing to recognize. Maybe that's what this is. This is our version of, of those concepts um, in reality. But you know, certainly if you're a Starbucks shareholder, none of this means anything. But I do have to point out, you know, they the last time this happened, they closed the store for a day and everybody had like diversity training, I think it was. And, you know, learning how to learning how to get along and include everybody and not not uh, not cause problems. Because if you remember, the previous incident was uh, I think it was in Philadelphia um, and two African-American gentlemen were asked to leave the store um, uh, for whatever reason. And that created a big hubbub and they shut the business down for a day and did diversity training. And, and of course, right away, the first thing I thought of, um, and it was pointed out to me, I didn't think of it uh, myself, but, but one of the first things I heard and I thought, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, uh, Chick-fil-A does this every week, right? They close down every Sunday, they're closed every Sunday and their employees are, you know, because they, they're, they're honoring the Sabbath, which doesn't even necessarily have to be a religious thing. Uh, it's just a break. Um, what one of our former podcast guests, Aaron Adelheit, would call a hard break once a week. Um, and so maybe, I don't know, maybe the folks at Starbucks need to just kind of take a hard break once a week. Maybe they're working too hard. They work too much <laughs> and they wind up doing this crazy stuff. But, you know, kind of meaningless for investors. Okay, one more. Uh, maybe two more. Um, an analyst at Rosenblatt Securities named uh, Jun Zhang cut his rating on Apple. Uh, it was a hold rating, which, you know, a hold rating in Wall Street is like sell, right? But he's actually changed the hold rating to sell. So maybe when he says hold, he really means it. Um, and with the stock lately, uh, actually, let me just get a quick quote here. The stock lately is up around 200 bucks. And he says his new price target is 150. And there's some questions, you know, I mean, for example, would a value investor say, you know, is it time to buy if the guy's cutting his, his, um, his rating? And I don't think this indicates anything about whether or not you should buy the stock. I did indicate on a previous podcast that of the the big fang companies, right? Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, uh, Google. Of those big companies, I, I do worry a bit about Apple because two thirds of the revenue comes from the iPhone. And this, you know, this is just a standard risk that we look for in businesses. We, we always look for this. I mean, and in this general category, like we always look for a company that's got too much revenue from one product. We always look for like companies that, that get, you know, some substantial amount of revenue from, um, from like Walmart or something. Because what if Walmart decides, ah, oh, we don't want to use you anymore. And it's, you know, 30% of the revenue. I promise you the day that announcement is made, the stock is going to plummet. Uh, and the business is going to be, is going to suffer. And it, it's a similar fear with Apple. It's just, I think it's just a reasonable, rational investor's viewpoint of Apple. What do you do when two thirds of your revenue come from one product? You could call it a category because there's different versions of the iPhone, but it, it's it's one product. Uh, or, or is the iPhone going to grow forever? Or is it going to even, you know, maintain current levels forever? I, I, don't, I don't think so. And the question then becomes, do these other businesses, which are admittedly kind of great, 
you know, uh, App Store, uh, iTunes Store, all that stuff. Is there going to be enough revenue from those to replace, you know, two thirds, tens of billions of dollars? I don't, you know, or some portion of that two thirds. Um, I don't think that's, I don't think Apple's a no brainer at all. I think it's kind of hard. It's in the too hard pile for me because of that. Anyway, um, just one more thing. We, we, anytime Elon Musk is in the news, we have to mention it. Um, Elon Musk says that um, self-driving chips will be m most likely coming to older Teslas, will be available for older model Teslas this year. Um, according to Musk, you know, the, they'll be rolled out to the older vehicles um, most likely, he says, by the end of the fourth quarter of this year. Um, of course, he said that on Twitter. Remember when he said he deleted Twitter, I guess? You know, so much for that idea. Maybe he was saying it tongue in cheek. The chips are manufactured by NVIDIA. And, you know, I, I, I don't think that this news is very meaningful at all. And I think, you know, Whitney Tilson, who, is, who has a really great newsletter published by Stansberry now called Empire Financial Research, I, I, I think Whitney's right. I think, you know, it's the beginning of the end for Tesla. There's too many problems. And again, like, you don't have to be a hater. It's about being a rational investor. And that's all it's about. It's an extremely highly competitive, capital-intensive business. And the fact that other companies, you know, a bunch of other companies are building, you know, very similar products uh, and they're actual car companies who have made money selling cars before. Uh, you know, the fact that they're doing it um, just means that making cars is still a highly competitive, highly capital intensive, and very likely will always be a low margin affair. And I just don't, you know, n brand new products like this, they make great stories, they can make a great stock for a short period of time, but they generally make really poor investments. And that's that's all I have to say about Tesla. Yes, Musk is weird and he exhibits weird behavior. And that doesn't make me feel good as a potential shareholder, right? You don't want to see a CEO behaving this way. I won't even get into it. You know what I'm talking about. Just Google Musk weirdness <laughs> and you'll probably get a bunch of stuff. But but that's how I feel about Tesla. I, I don't think this news changes anything. And I think, I think Whitney Tilson is right. I think the stock will probably go below $100 by the end of the year. So there's some other stuff going on. Uh, actually, just one more, okay? Just one more. The SEC is suing this, um, this fellow named Daniel Pacheco, who, and they allege that he engaged in a $26 million like crypto Ponzi scheme, um, that he sold unregistered securities through uh, some companies called iPro Solutions LLC, iPro Networks LLC, and he was selling investors what he called points, and they could theoretically redeem their points and convert it to the pro currency digital asset that was affiliated with his companies. Uh, apparently, you know, it's all caving in, and he says he doesn't have to pay cash back to investors. But and and the SEC is suing him over it. Um, to me, this is just kind of a sign of the times. And look, we had Mark Yusko in the program, and we talked about Bitcoin. And 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 Yusko is long Bitcoin, and I said, you know, I I bought a thousand bucks worth of Bitcoin just to have a tiny little bit of skin in the game and try to figure out, you know, if a smart guy like Mark thinks it's worth thinking about, I'll put a thousand bucks in it, and that'll get me some skin in the game, and you know, I'll do some work and and think more about it. So there are, there are like a couple thousand of these cryptocurrencies now, and you know, at some point, like. Um, even during a mining boom, okay, one of the companies is going to be legitimate, but but many of them will be illegitimate. No, and a lot of them will be scams, like this guy allegedly is. And this is very typical. I think there will not be two thousand cryptocurrencies five or ten years from now. There will probably be one, if any, you know, or maybe a handful. Maybe there will be, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum and a couple other things, if they're still around at all. Um, and this is just, it's a sign of the times. You'll probably see a bunch of stories over the next few years about, you know, cryptocurrency 
Ponzi schemes and other scams. And it, it's just, it doesn't surprise me one bit. So, you know, if you're into cryptocurrencies, um, it's risky stuff. It's, it's, it's extraordinarily risky. And I realize that's the nature of opportunity, right? Opportunity involves risk, but, um, you know, some things are just so crazy that if you're not an expert, you have no business going anywhere near them. Um, or, you know, like I'm putting a, an amount of money in it that I can afford to lose all of it uh, just so I can gain familiarity. That's probably the only thing I would ever <laughs> recommend anyone do, if anything. So that's a little bit of what's new this week. Now let's get on with our interview. This week's guest is Tim Price. Tim Price is principal and founder of Price Value Partners, a London-based value investing oriented fund established in 2014. The fund seeks to invest in companies of exceptional quality that they believe are trading at a meaningful discount to their inherent value, the Benjamin Graham value approach, to which I say, amen, brother. Tim has 25 years in capital markets and 15 years as a discretionary multi-asset portfolio manager and chief investment officer at three successive firms, Henry Ansbacher, Union Bancaire Privé, and the PFP Group. I hope I pronounced those even close. He was shortlisted for five successive years in the UK Private Asset Managers Program and was the winner in 2005 in the category of defensive investing. Tim is also a columnist for Money Week magazine. Tim is also the co-host of the State of the Markets podcast. Tim Price, welcome to the program, sir. Thanks very much for having me. Pleasure to be here. All right. So, uh, Tim, I was noticing something. Actually, b b before we talk about that, can you tell me something like about your early experiences as an investor? Like, wh how old were you, for example, when you decided upon a career as a, as a professional finance guy? Okay, so I was watching uh, what I think is the most magnificent film of the 21st century uh, at the weekend, which is um, The Social Network. And that, I haven't read the source material, but the source material apparently is a book called The Accidental Billionaire. Well, I, I'm sadly not a billionaire, but I'm an accidental fund manager. So I came into the city entirely by accident. So it's purely a quirk of fate that in 1991, when I graduated with an English degree, the only job I could get was as a bond salesman for a crappy Japanese bank, which is tautology because they're all crap. But um, that was essentially the way it worked. And I couldn't get a job in finance or advertising which or journalism, which were the uh, sorry, I couldn't get a job in advertising or journalism, which were the, the fields I was previously interested in. So on the basis of sort of needs must, I, I took the first job offer that came my way. And that, as I said, that was fixed income sales. So I did that for 10 years. But uh, uh, after a, a couple of years, I got to quite like the landscape. So I decided to stick around. And the rest is the rest is history. I see. That's uh, an auspicious beginning. I was noticing something I wanted to I wanted to start out with this because I, I'm, I'm excited about it. I was noticing something in your book, Investing Through the Looking Glass. I noticed that the table of contents is split into two parts. The first part is called problems, and the second part is called solutions. And the problems are all, you know, the banks, the central banks, the economists and financial theorists, fund managers. And I thought you very correctly in the introduction said, you know, the financial crisis was everybody's fault. Everybody had a role to play. But the thing that really made me smile was the first chapter of part two, which is called Solutions. The first chapter is value investing. And I thought, man, that's great because today nobody thinks value investing is the solution to anything. You know, value is not a popular strategy right now. Um, so how is, how is value investing a solution? Uh, well, I'm kind of, sort of going for the long run here because you're, you're right that being a value investor in 2019 feels a bit like being the world's best buggy whip manufacturer. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping, kind of hoping against hope that once again, you know, reversion to the mean is going to work and, you know, value is going to be relevant. The reality is, I mean, I've, I've been managing private client portfolios for 
the last 20 years and for the last 10 years you might as well just have bought an s p 500 tracker for all the difference it makes so there's been no there's been no benefit whatsoever to asset diversification to uh to ed- any style any strategy other than just buy us mega caps at some point that's going to have to change right the, the, when these things don't go on forever the problem is uh they can always they can go on much longer than you would ever believe well that's that's absolutely absolutely right so i remember very distinctly <clears throat> hearing a guy called dylan grice at a money week conference back in around 2010 or so and what he said was that when the when, when the soviet union first came into being um it, that was as a result of the 19 was it 1917 russian revolution and pretty much every year thereafter, you would have intelligent, objective third parties saying, you know, this thing is just a pack of cards. It's not, it, you know, this thing is going to blow away. The command control economy isn't going to work. Well, that's fine. But the Berlin Wall didn't fall until 1989. So I guess all we're saying is that, uh, you know, it, just as Adam Smith said, there's a great deal of ruin in the country. There's also a great deal of ruin in a dysfunctional financial system. Right. Um so I wonder about this um, this cycle that we're in, because a question that that our listeners have asked, and that I think about too, I think we're all thinking about it, is, um, for example, U.S. profit margins. This is, in you know, in the words of um, of Jeremy Grantham, you know, the most mean reverting data series in all of finance, and yet it continues. Corporate profit margins continue to bump up against these highs. And we're sitting here kind of waiting for the cycle to turn, you know, as you say, waiting for mean reversion to, to come back. And it just, it's, it's utterly persistent. And we wonder, for example, reader, uh, listeners and readers of ours have asked, you know, aren't there a whole bunch of different businesses in the world nowadays? And aren't those higher margin, lower capex type businesses? And wouldn't that naturally mean that, I hate to even say the words, but doesn't that mean this time it's different? Isn't it different this time, Tim? So I can accept that some of the landscapes changed. So, for example, I saw a piece earlier. I can't remember who made the point, but it was basically suggesting that, you know, book book value no longer has any real meaning as as a metric. And I can accept that because in a world in which basically every decent company is in some respects a technology company because they use the web they use digital technology they use you know all that kind of stuff then things like book value don't have that much meaning book value really only has meaning in a world of primary extractive business and then secondary manufacturing business where if you drop things on your foot they hurt so in a world where so much value is now wrapped in intellectual property and intangible stuff like branding Okay, I accept the argument that price to book isn't necessarily such a good metric, but I can't see how the landscape's 100% changed because if, I mean, clearly also the interest rate uh, situation is completely different to what people have experienced. So if you can basically get free money to launch a business um, and expand and draw on credit and all the rest, then, okay, so that that enables a startup to get properly global in a fairly short period of time. But by the same token, that also means that you, that startup should face practically infinite competition. So for all the profit margins going up, they should also be competed back down by competitive forces. I don't believe the free market's gone away. So the market still works. It's just working a little differently because times have changed. Well, the, the market still works, but, but there's a lot of distortion to that market. So in a world in which um, in a benchmark government bond yields across a wide variety of countries are now negative. That's not a world in which normal economics necessarily applies. If people are willing to pay to own extraordinarily poor quality rubbish um, in in informed debt, then that's a world in which there's no playbook for that world. Right. But they don't consider... They don't consider what they're holding poor quality rubbish. What they, They consider what they're holding so good you know, that in many cases, they're required to own it. So they have enough capital, right? Well, that, that's, that's kind of like a separate argument. So I think there's a very fair argument to be had for is there agency risk attached to whatever asset you happen to be buying? So it, the, the way to see if there's agency risk is if someone's managing a gigantic fund, um, clearly a, in a for profit business, 
then how much of that fund is owned by the person managing it? And if it's a bond fund, I can guarantee it's going to be next to nil. All they're doing is tracking a benchmark. Whereas if it's a, uh, so say, for the sake of argument, a value equity fund, there's a reasonable chance that first it's going to be an awful lot smaller in NAV terms. The size of the fund is going to be smaller. But also it's more likely the manager is going to have a meaningful piece of skin in the game. Right. But my, I guess what I'm focusing on, though, is the perceived quality. For example, and you know we've seen this before, right? The, the, the U.S. 30-year mortgage was this wonderful, safe asset. You couldn't go wrong owning it. And then Wall Street found a way to turn it into toxic waste. And sovereign debt from some of the world's, you know, biggest, biggest countries, you know, biggest Western countries is supposed to be this wonderful safe asset. But by sending the yields into negative territory, they've turned it into toxic waste. And yet, uh, until something cracks, the perception of quality remains, bizarrely. But you're absolutely right. But then it becomes a question of confidence. So in the bond market, I'd argue that virtually nothing has any real value of any kind. I mean, that the great insight of the Austrian school uh, economists was that value is subjective. So value isn't some kind of universal that's the same throughout space and time for every investor the way, say, gold is. Value is inherent. It's, it's contextual. It's subjective. So your, your sense of value for, say, a bond and mine, they're probably going to be on the same side of the page. But for, for someone who's a sovereign wealth fund or someone who's a government, I mean, the government example is the most obvious one where there's a contradiction uh, between attitudes because the government wants actively to devalue the, you know, w the, the worth of its debt pile, whereas the investor clearly wants to maximize the value. So there's no way you can square those two circles. So I guess I guess where I'm coming to is, is the, the the best way to describe the state of the markets because I've been waiting for the sky to fall in for the last ten years because I don't understand the world in which we now live. Uh, if if you can have zero zero rates or negative rates and everyone's behaving as if you know you know this is a gorgeous party this is never going to end and the the punch bowl keeps getting spiked. The only thing I think you can acknowledge is, and this is this is this is a scientific observation rather than a sort of economic one because I'm not an economist and I despise most people who practice that bastard science. Um, that the you can acknowledge that in any physical system, let's take say snow settling on a, a snow mass. You can acknowledge that there comes a point where the snow mass shifts from being in stable equilibrium to being in unstable equilibrium. And once that point has been reached, you know that there's going to be an avalanche. What you can't say for sure is exactly which snowflake is going to trigger it. But you just know it's going to happen. Or in the same way, you know, you know that the branch of the tree is going to break. You just don't know which bit of whatever lands on it is going to, is going to, is going to cause the branch to break. But the, the, you just know that it's not safe to be on the branch anymore. And then it's a question of what your objective is. The objective for me and for, for our clients is it's not to maximize returns under all circumstances. It's simply to preserve the capital they've got and then try and eke out a return on top, but in such a way that they don't risk losing everything. So the thing that I'm most concerned about is, is, is catastrophic risk of, uh, of, of loss. The Lehman 2008 moment, if you like. And that risk surely today is now higher than it's ever been in, in history. I completely agree. I think looking at markets, looking at actual asset prices, we're definitely in the minority, though. Because the thing is, you've got the, the, the debate is slanted by the, say, the, the practitioners in the debate who assume that it's like this, so the value argument is the same for everybody and everything at all times, everywhere in the world. But it's not. So it, here in the UK at the moment, we've got this bizarre situation where one of our highest profile fund managers is going through an existential crisis. This is a guy called Neil Woodford, who's had to close one or had to gate one of his funds because he's had so much redemption pressure. His business may never recover from this. Now, I'm not saying this because I, I'm sort of bathing in schadenfreude, uh, because there's some knock on effects from that, which is as the manager of a daily dealing, what's called a usage fund, which is the sort of the gold and the gold standard outside the US for a collective fund. You can't sell usage funds into the US, but you can sell them everywhere else in the world. There's now a massive sort of question mark overhanging all similar funds, all of these funds, because no one knows for certain whether if they if they make a sell, if they make a redemption request, that redemption request is going to be fulfilled. And the the awkward thing about this development is this feels uncomfortably like I remember the, the financial crisis, I would suggest, can be dated back to summer 07, 
when a couple of money market funds run by the French bank Paribas um, had to close because they couldn't they couldn't um, they couldn't be redeemed. They couldn't they couldn't make good on redemption requests. So it seems to me as if we're in the early stages of history repeating itself with a, a 10 year lag. I believe we are. I believe I, I think there is. I think it's we're obviously much closer to the end of the cycle than the beginning. And I would I would suspect there's more of that, more of this to come. But you mentioned USITs and um, that to me, that rings like, uh, you know, it's just like previous episodes. I mean, in, in 1920s, you know, they had those investment trusts and then, you know, in the 60s. Knickerbocker, Knickerbocker Trust and all that stuff, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and, and every episode, there's this instrument or instruments, multiple instruments, perhaps this time around, where everybody thinks it's the safe no-brainer. And it turns out that, you know, it's not only not the safe no-brainer easy thing to buy and hold, but, you know, if too many people buy it, it turns into toxic waste. And, you know, who who would have thought that, that uh, you know, this Neil Woodford uh, would, would go the way he's gone, for example. And I think there's, there's also a, <clears throat> a legitimate concern over, just so we can sort of just bring in every, everybody into this sort of, you know, pool of horror. Uh, there's also a legitimate concern over the status of the exchange traded fund world because there's plenty of illiquid assets that are that are the, the prime components of ETFs and there's a presumption that these there is daily liquidity and these funds can easily be bought and sold without triggering any kind of change in the market environment but if if that analogy if that if that comparison with the snow mass is correct then the same problem is 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 potentially going to affect every kind of tradable fund uh, particularly those that are in assets that are say on that liquid to begin with, whether that's property or whether it's, you know, uh, government debt or, or more particularly corporate debt. <clears throat> you cited a figure earlier in relation to U.S. profit margins. There's a figure that a stat that I, I seem to recall. I hope I hope this is correct. But it was basically suggesting that I think 15 percent of S&P 500 companies can only pay their dividends by borrowing to do so. In other words, they're not. They're not generating any positive cash flow. Uh, that wouldn't. So, I don't know the number, but it does. It sounds like it could easily be true to me. So, and we, we I can certainly validate the number in the closer to home. So, I know it's the fact that the likes of you know our, some of our big pharmaceutical companies, the likes of GlaxoSmithKline, AstraZeneca, they're they're paying out more money than they earn in gross profits. So that is completely unsustainable. The only way they can maintain their high dividend yields is by borrowing to, to facilitate them. But over over time, that's going to lead to bankruptcy. So it's clearly not tenable. And the thing is, then they're, 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 they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't because they cut the dividend and then the share price is going to collapse anyway. That's right. And bankers hate it when your equity collapses. I, I want to shift gears a little bit because um, there's a particular issue among value investors that kind of cuts them in half. Half of them are part of the Warren Buffett school that says gold is a worthless waste of time. And the other half think gold is a really good idea. And you and I are in that, the latter camp. Um, and, and, and you, do you not currently, you, you have, you have gold in your fund at this time, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so, so we, we offer two things. We offer a fund, which is the fund is, a, is a standalone global equity value fund. So it's pure equity, pure long only equity. But within that we own gold miners. Uh, and in our discretionary offering, we also, which is multi-asset, we have, let's say, 20% exposure to gold bullion and also to, to gold mining entities. This this whole Buffett debate is a, is a, is a is a sort of is a false debate because it presumes you're you're comparing apples with apples. But I don't think Buffett ever was. So that the Buffett complaint was always that given a choice between a pile of gold or a pile of IBM stock, you're better off owning the IBM stock or whichever equity you happen to be. You know, you have, you have, it happens to be favour of the moment. I don't dispute that because gold is inert and uh, a, a living company is a claim on the real economy. So I don't dispute that at all. But that's not why we own gold. We don't own gold to outperform IBM. We own gold, I would suggest, as a cash proxy, which is going to be a better form of cash or currency than anything anything else on the planet. So it's a diversifier. It's not a you can get it. You can really fall down the rabbit hole when you start talking about gold, as I'm sure you're aware. But I, I've, I've had the, the, the great luck to be moving in circles 
with people far more intelligent than me over the last 10, 15 years. And so here's here's a line that I, I, I there's a lot of weight I attach a lot of weight to. And it goes like this. Gold is not even an investment. It is a conscious decision to refrain from investing until the return of an honorary of an honest monetary system makes a calculation of relative asset prices possible. Now, that is a heavy quote. But it's I think it also happens to be true. So in other words, what in terms of just, just agreeing what gold is, it, you know, you can, you can spend all day just, you know, arguing the arguing the, the, the nature of the question. But I, I would say what gold represents is the, the the soundest, purest form of honest money. Right. It's 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 the it's not the thing you're measuring. It's the yardstick itself. Exactly. So again, and the, the same person who came up with that great line about gold not being an investment also said, if you're trying to measure the price of gold using, say, the US dollar, which is the conventional way of doing it, has been for hundreds of years, then that's like trying to measure a suit using a piece of elastic. The only honest response is to throw away the elastic and get something that isn't going isn't, isn't to be malleable, it's going to be fixed. And so, and this, we get, we get back in terms of science here. So there's a, so a kilogram, we know what a kilogram is. A kilogram is the mass of a given amount of material at a given temperature, at a given height above sea level in a given laboratory in Northern France. That's what a kilogram is. What's a dollar worth? What's the definition of a dollar's value? There isn't one. Same for sterling, same for the euro, same for yen, same for renminbi. So we're operating in a system whereby we're using these things as units, but that their own worth value hasn't been defined. So we're putting the cart before the horse. The, the, unit, of, the unit of account is gold here, because an ounce of gold is an ounce of gold in here in London or in New York or Paris or Shanghai or Beijing or Tokyo. The ounce of gold is the, is the universal store of value here. I, I can't disagree with any of that. You, I wonder if you've read George Gilder's piece on uh, his 21st century rationale for owning gold. I, I, I know Gilder, but I haven't, I haven't read this. Yeah, so you mentioned the kilogram, and he goes into a whole bit in, in his piece where he talks about the whole international system, you know, the kilogram and the meter and all of these things are defined. He, I think there are seven of them. And he says five or six of the seven are defined by units of time, ultimately. And that that winds up being there's information in an ounce of gold about what it took to bring it out of the ground and the time it took to bring it out of the ground. And obviously, he's, he's an extremely smart guy. I'm not anywhere in that league. So I'm never going to do his argument justice. But I would I would recommend looking at it because you sound like... Your ideas sound like you're sort of headed in that direction, and that you would have an appreciation for it. I think I'm not. I, I'm not trying to get. I'm not trying to get on a high horse, but it, it just seems to me that people have people just accept at face value what what they're what they're given by, say, the press or the media. And uh, I mean, at the moment, in, here in the UK, we're beset by this existential crisis called Brexit, and maybe in in a similar way, you guys in the states are beset by the existential issue that is Trump. Um, and it, it kind of they're like black holes, they kind of suck in all of the energy and the, you know, the, the passion, and everything in the argument. But but one thing I'm finding in in, uh, in response to the whole Brexit uh, predicament, if you want, is that it's 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 the way I describe it, it's, it's like a gigantic rock has been lifted um, over our culture. And nobody in the entire country can quite believe the kind of scandalous pond life that's scuttling around underneath that rock that was never previously revealed. As a result of which, I, I think that what I call the magic Brexit wrecking ball is just going to take out massive swathes of our establishment. I think the House of Lords is going to go. I think the BBC is going to go. Half of our mainstream media is not going to survive this process. The civil service is not going to survive this process because all of the horror of these things in the establishment has finally been revealed and everyone just goes, Ugh, this is just disgusting. I don't want any part of this. And it's just, it's, it's like, um, it's like a benign meteorite of death. <laughs> Did you say a benign meteorite of death? Yeah. Cause you know, there's this idea, the concept of the, the friendly meteorite of death, which is like, Oh my God, can modern society get any more batshit? 
And the answer is no. So then the, the, you know, the meteorite of death then hoves into view and then just takes out the entire planet. And it's like, good night, good night, Vienna. Well, I'm thinking of it in a slightly more benign way, which is maybe like it only takes out it only takes out the unworthy. So the, the, the chosen will survive the benign meteorite of death and only only the mainstream media get pulverized. I think there are a lot of people listening to the sound of our voices who are probably cheering that idea right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you mentioned Brexit. You're a lever, correct? Yeah, yeah. So basically, I came to the. Uh, I'm not. I, I was. I think a lot of people in the the Brexit referendum debate were were torn, and that that's certainly reflected by the the outcome. So. Uh, at the end, in, in 23rd of June, 2016, what a long time ago that now seems, 52% of the voting uh, of the electorate voted for leave and 48% voted for remain. So that suggests the whole country was split down the middle. Now, it may be that in, in turn, most people who, who, who went to the ballot box ultimately sort of thought, you know, I really don't feel too strongly either way. So they probably tossed a coin to decide. But I was never a sort of fair weather lever. I, because of, I suppose, my experiences in the capital markets and particularly around, you know, since the financial crisis, I had this, if you like, slow Damascene conversion to free markets, to Austrian or classical economics, to sound money, to libertarian principles, to small government. It was, it, for me, it was absolutely quite, absolutely certain that our best interests as a country were served by leaving the the European Union and and, and re, re, reachieving our independence, which also of course means you know the facility to you know to uh, arrange free trade agreements with the rest of the world, which is also growing an awful lot faster than the European Union is. So for me, it was a, a no brainer. But I accept for many people, it's it was a lot more nuanced than that. Right. One of the obvious things people talk about all the folks who are going to lose their jobs. What, what do you say to them? That never happened. So we've got the lowest we've got the lowest jobless rate and the lowest youth unemployment rate in the entire EU after the but vote. The, but the UK hasn't really left yet, though, right? No, that's true. That's true. But I mean, with a bit of luck, you know, you know, um, and in Charlotte, then the thing is, it's finally going to happen. But they, with Project Fear, the the sort of continuity remain faction, said that there'd be, uh, I think, half a million who would lose their jobs as an immediate result of the referendum ver vote itself. Quite apart from what actually happens when we when we manage to finally extract ourselves from the EU, so um, the, the the amount I mean, during the referendum campaign, there were clearly exaggerations and distortions on both sides. So I'm not I'm not claiming anyone behaved like an angel, but the thing people should perhaps appreciate is the entirety of the British establishment was for Remain, the BBC, the government itself, the House of Lords, the mainstream media, the IMF, the CBI. U.S. president itself, himself at the time, uh, Saint Obama. You know, all of these people were were, were in league to, to make this thing happen. So it's in a sense, it's no real surprise that as the the, the vote went the other way, their entire value system has completely collapsed. It's, it's just disintegrated. So we are in the throes of, and it's lasted three years now. We're in the throes of the biggest nervous breakdown in in our probably in our country's history since since we had our civil war back in the 17th century. Well, I certainly pretend to have no great insight about Brexit, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to hear your ideas. Um, there are other things that I wanted to ask you about. Um, one of them, you know, you talked about in your book and elsewhere, you talked about value investing and gold, but you also mention hedge funds and trend following. These are not topics I often hear a value investor discussing. Uh, what, uh, what, what's your insight there? What do you, what do these things mean to you? So there's a piece by a company called us company called research affiliates, uh, which is a tremendous piece and it's about two or three years old now. And it's called something like how not to get fired by using smart beta, which is a slightly inauspicious title, but the, the practical outcome of this piece, which I recommend to anybody, and you can find it through the research affiliates website is there are two strategies, and this is just in the stock market, that have continually led to outperformance versus the index itself. One of them is called value, and the other one is called momentum. And the other two strategies broadly defined that people tend to use are uh, quality and growth. And the point about the research affiliates piece is that quality and growth have continually underperformed versus the market as a whole. So 
always saying for momentum, momentum is basically just a, a, a trend following approach. I.e. what has worked will continue to work. What has underperformed will most likely continue to underperform. And together, those two strategies have been the best performing strategies in the stock market for the last 70 years. But you can also take the momentum approach and apply it to other markets. So the whole point of having a diversified portfolio is that the components of that portfolio have to be uncorrelated versus each other. There is no point in having a, a portfolio that comprises four types of assets if those four types of assets trade lockstep with each other. So in other words, if you have basically property plus bonds plus blue chip stocks, there's a fairly high degree of correlation between those three asset classes. But you stick in gold and all of a sudden you have a diversifier. You stick in trend followers and most definitely you have a diversifier because if we take, say, 2008, uh, which is a year that probably needs no introduction, the worst year in financial markets in living memory, the only strategy I'm aware of that did particularly well in 08, other than basically bonds, long bonds and gold, was trend following. So I won't name it, but there's one trend following fund that we use. In 2008, it made 108%. Most people probably lost half their money in 2008. But the reason that fund made money, and, and most trend following funds did make money in 2008, is because they can go short stuff. So, And the thing is, we're not just talking about the stock market. We're talking about stocks, commodities, currencies, you know, the works, interest rates, everything. And all they're looking to do is trying to ride a trend. And that price trend could be higher or it could be lower. As long as there are strong price trends in operation, these funds will try and exploit them. And they come into their own when everything basically just pukes at the same time, which is what happened in 2008. And this is, this is portfolio insurance. But the reason why they're not more widely familiar is because, that, because there's hedge funds. They're not allowed to market to retail investors. So most people never heard of them. All right, Tim. Uh, we're actually toward the end of our time here. And um, I, when, I, when I get a guy like you who's been around the block a, a few times, um, I, I always like to ask, you know, if you can leave our listeners um, with a single idea in their heads, what might that idea be? There's a, a guy that I've come across recently who I've fallen massively in love with. Um, so there's a, the, the world's biggest man crush happening here in central London today. And the, the gentleman in question, I'm sure you'll know him, is a guy called Naval Ravikant, who's a gentleman of Indian extraction, who's a, a Silicon Valley um, venture capital investor or private equity investor, seed, seed angel investor. Um, and I've heard him on a, a couple of podcasts now, and, he's, he, and he also gives great tweet. So you can find him on Twitter at Naval, N-A-V-A-L. Um, but to, to boil it down into an idea, it would basically be find your inner stoic. So someone that he's referenced on a number of occasions is the great Roman Stoic Marcus Aurelius. And the, 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 the critical takeaway is basically there are things that you, we all worry about stuff. We all worry probably too much about stuff, particularly in a financial market context. There are things that we worry about that we can change. And there are things that we worry about that we can't change. If you can't change them, there's no point worrying about them. And if you can change them, fix them. Easier said than done, but admittedly profound advice. Well, I'm not claiming it's easy, but, but the great thing about it is once you start adopting that Marcus Aurelius approach, you can basically turn off mainstream media chatter and only focus on the stuff that really delivers value. Also excellent advice. There, we, there are folks, I don't know if you, you probably have heard of Rolf Debelli. He's Oh, I was just going to say the uh, avoid news. So the, the essay avoid news is, is, is abs falls absolutely into this camp. That, I mean, the, the Dvelli quote is basically, you know, news is to the mind what sugar is to the body. It's just this massive distraction that's actually poisonous. We we're all better off without it. But I accept it's very difficult to wean yourself off. You have to do it in stages. Yeah, you do. Also, you know, given uh, what you do for a living and what I do for a living, it's kind of difficult to, to do that. But it is possible. So um, with that, you know, thanks a lot, Tim. I, I really am so happy that we could have you on the podcast. Absolute pleasure. Well, I, I hope I can repay the favor sometime. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'd, I'd love to be on State of the Markets if you ever have room for us. But I want to remind people that your book is called Investing Through the Looking Glass. And it's a really great look at what is wrong with the financial system and also what you can do about it yourself. Um, 
So thanks very much, Tim. And I, I, you know, I hope we'll get together again soon. My pleasure. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you very much for having me. All right, Tim. Thank you. Bye-bye. That was really great, folks. And um, actually, we have another interview this week. It's a special interview. It's, it's kind of short. So I want you to stay tuned. And it comes right after the mailbag. I'm not going to tell you anything else about it. It's really special. Great story. Just stay tuned till after the mailbag. All right, folks, it's time for the mailbag. Remember, your feedback is extraordinarily important to the success of our show. Uh, and I love reading it every week. I read every feedback email every single week. Uh, and I, you know, I put as many of them um, on the show as possible. Uh, so just write in with questions or comments of any kind, including politely worded criticisms, to feedback at investorhour.com. Okay, let's go. First one's from Gary D. Gary D. says, could you please address, again, as deeply as you can, arguments for and against share repurchases? Personally, I think they should be eliminated or at the very least reduced. Maybe you could eliminate share repurchases through taking on debt, then repurchase actions could only be taken on with the allocation of free cash flow. Perhaps you know someone who can bring some illumination regarding this issue on as a guest. After all, you always have the very best guests. I've really enjoyed all of your guests so far. You know some fascinating people. Thanks as always and keep up the great work. You're doing great, Gary D. Well, thank you, Gary, for all those kind words. And you know, I, I don't agree that we should restrict um, corporate capital allocation in this manner. Uh, as an investor, you have every right. Of, you know, your your the the main thing you can do, of course, is sell. If a, if a company is buying back shares in a manner which you think is destructive of shareholder value, you don't need to own the shares. And it's better, I think, for everyone if you let them do what they want to do rather than what they're required to do. Because as soon as you require people to do things, they start trying to get around the rules and it makes things worse um, uh, oftentimes. Uh, and I think this falls into that category. And so, yeah, I think, um, you know, companies that borrow a lot of money to buy back shares, um, eventually, if they keep it up, they can get in trouble. But some of them that do it are absolutely wonderful businesses. And they're just gushing so much money, they literally don't know what to do with it. So they buy back shares with it. Um, and you have to, it, it, you can't, I don't think you can blanket this issue. You've got to take it one company at a time. That really is the bottom line. But it's a good question. And, you know, arguments for and against share repurchases. Look, the only argument for a share repurchase is that it's a good investment given the alternatives the company has available to it with its capital. If it's not, if the stock isn't priced right and attractive enough versus other alternatives, it makes no sense because you'd pursue the alternatives, wouldn't you? And that really is all there is to it. Late in the cycle, when companies are gushing free cash flow, they all like to buy back stock because you know the, the opportunities get more difficult. And actually, part of it is not that at all. Part of it is simply that in a given business that does one or two things, there's only so much, if it's highly profitable, there's only so much you can do with that excess cash flow. And so they, they buy back stock. And frankly, buying back stock and paying dividends are two ways to get the money out of their hands so that they can't do any harm with it. <laughs> so think of it that way. But it's a good question, and it's one that people should continue to ask about all the companies that they invest in. Um, I hope that helps somewhat. Okay, number two this week is from Tim B., and Tim B. says, I really appreciate your knowledge and the information that you continually give out on the show. I'm sure it requires a fair amount of time to prepare for each week's episode. Thanks. Last but not least, uh, and he had a longer email here. Uh, last but not least, can you assist with somewhat of a conflict resolution? As a Stansbury analyst, you promote your thesis of value. Other Stansbury analysts, Shug and Doc, would fall into your camp of longer term holding of equities. Um, and they're not day traders, all of which are great. But the trade stop system that all analysts promote sometimes disagree with the thesis that one might be following. So the question is, 
if a Stansberry analyst or you recommend an equity and trade stops is contradicting it at that time, would you buy based on the thesis or the indicators from the trade stop system? Since ultimately we're in this game for money, when do you cap that gut feeling emotion thesis and use the data trade stops? I know the standard reply is remove emotion from the deal and have a plan, but would you follow the indicators and be in and out several times during the life of the thesis? I am new to the investing game and apologize for the newbie issues. Tim B. Tim, nothing to apologize for. It's a great question. But equating the um, the investment thesis that we spend a fair amount of time on in our newsletters uh, with the gut feeling and the emotion is false to me. I mean, that's based on data and experience and understanding what a good business is. So I I don't, I, I can't say, you know, the thesis is about gut and emotion and trade stops is about the data. Trade stops is, for me, the primary use is a tool to prevent you from incurring catastrophic losses. The standard mistake people make in the stock market is frankly selling. Nobody knows how or when to sell. It's very hard, very hard. When you get a great business, the time to sell, in my experience, is, is never. And I know because I violated it enough times to know that that is what you should do. So trade stops just helped you set trailing stops so that you know, God forbid there should be some enormous bear market that takes everything down 50 or 60 or 70%, um, which would not be crazy numbers from current levels, by the way, over a two or three year bear market. Um, and, and trade stops helps you avoid that by cutting losses quickly and early. That's the primary use. And of course, they also have a system that that tells you when to get in. And if you want to try to use that in conjunction with somebody else's advice, you got to work that out for yourself. All, you know, I, we do what we do. I do what I do in extreme value. And, you know, when I say buy now, I mean buy now. I don't mean wait for trade stops to tell you when to buy. But that's my decision. I can't make that for you. And you said, you know, you, you know, the standard reply is to move from emotion from the deal and have a plan. We can't go much beyond that. I can't tell you um, how to arrange uh, our, our advice in your mind so that it works best for you. That's th there's too many variables, and it and it really gets dangerous legally because we're not allowed to give individual advice or anything that might be perceived as individual advice. So you know, I ultimately I I think I can't quite help you. I hope I've shed some light on what I think uh, when I make a recommendation. Uh, and that that's worth something to you. But it's a very good question. And a lot of people have it. We can just, we can only go so far with the answer. And I'm sorry about that. Okay, last number three here uh, this week is by Halbert T. And Halbert T has a long email and he referred to a specific recommendation from a Stansbury publication. And I don't want to you know, give that away for free because I think I'd be getting a phone call from the editor of that publication uh, about that. So I will read his question, leaving out those details. And I left a whole chunk of the question off, but here goes. Halbert T says, I'm contemplating contacting this company's CEO to share my concerns, but I'm not sure if it would be well received or even perceived as hostile. What would you do? And do you ever take this angle of risk into consideration before investing? For now, I'm holding off buying any shares due to my findings. Feel free to shorten the question and remove company-specific information. Halbert T. Yes, Halbert T. I removed all the company-specific information. The answer to this question is simple. You are an investor. You are a prospective shareholder. And if your questions about the vulnerabilities that you perceive in this business are not well-received, that tells you something about the company. If they're not capable of of responding to your concerns in a rational manner do you do you you know do you want to be involved with them i don't know if you do but that's up to you there's more to an investment than what i just said but it's a variable and i know for me personally i wouldn't like it if i had a concern and i called them up and said you know i have this concern about a vulnerability in your business uh based on my own expertise and you know i just want to share it with you and see what you say and if I get a mouthful of, you know, 
BS back where, you know, they're clearly not interested in dealing with it. Um, they could be telling me something and they could be telling me something I, I don't really like. So that's all I'm going to say about that. I definitely recommend calling up this company and sharing your concerns. Absolutely. How they handle it tells you as much as, as anything. Okay, folks, we have a special short little interview right now with Rob Lamoureux. And Rob Lamoureux is just like you. He's a subscriber to Stansberry. And we want to talk to him today because he's got a really, really cool story to tell. So, Rob, when did you first uh, get involved with Stansberry? Uh, well, actually, Dan, I have you to thank for that because uh, Extreme Value was, I believe, my first uh, subscription. And it wasn't long after that that the dominoes started falling and I became an Alliance subscriber in 2008, which was, as I'm sure you know, just before the world fell apart for the second time in nine years. So uh, it was really good timing on my part. Uh, but I've been with yes, the company. Sounds like you found us just in time. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> in more ways than I can count. <laughs> <laughs> so you became an Alliance member in 2008. But you found your way to another one of our products, didn't you? Yes. Actually, it was shortly after that. Um, I don't, I'm don't. i sure I don't have to explain to most people how the Alliance uh, program works. You get everything that Stansberry uh, publishes for as long as they publish it. And so in 2009, uh, a Bond uh, pr publication began. Uh, it was the first time I had ha ever had any exposure to quality bond research. Um, and I say this as somebody who 10 years prior to that had been working for a, a Wall Street uh, brokerage firm. I was a retail broker, uh, but the business model then uh, in the late 90s was stocks and stocks and more stocks. And that's where 99% of the research was based. So this was my first foray into buying individual bonds and uh, I'll say that I, I had a few really good experience at the outset and I was hooked and I've been, uh, I've been doing it ever since. So the first time you ever bought a bond was after you bought Stansberry Credit Opportunities or after it was delivered to you, I guess. Yep, absolutely. It was uh, the, the first version of the bond program was in 2009. And yeah, that was the, that was the first, uh, the first individual bond I had ever bought. And uh, when I sold it three years later, it was up over 300%. And uh, well, with results like that, I've been, uh, like I said, I've been hooked ever since. And uh, it's been great because I get the results that I need, obviously. I mean, I'll get 300% every time I trade. Nobody does. But uh, the results are consistently excellent. Um, I sleep like a baby at night because, as you know, bonds are not designed to spike wildly up and down and following the dot-com crash and following the, uh, the the mortgage snafu in 08 and 09 when stocks once again were jumbled all around. It's been nice to have a stable of investments that are just steady performers and steadily profitable too. So the thing that caught my ear was 300% on a bond. Wow. That must have been some deeply discounted bond, huh? It was. I actually remember that, uh, you know, as you know, bonds are usually priced at $1,000 each. Uh, but then they trade on the bond market the way stocks trade on the stock market. And this particular one had been priced below $200. So virtually the entire world had given up on it. Uh, but Porter and his team did a deep dive into the numbers. They said there's an excellent chance this company's not going anywhere and they're going to be able to pay it back. So I bought this bond below $200 and three and a half years, I not only got my full thousand dollar face value back, but I received interest all the way. Uh, I, I actually received more in interest than I had even paid on the bond. So it was uh, it was an extraordinary performer for me. And again, I not not every bond performs that well. That that one's an outlier. But everything that I have done 
uh, taking into account everything, the winners, the losers, all of them, uh, I win so much more often than I lose with these things. And uh, I just, I, I can't say enough, uh, and I know I sound a little bit like a fanboy here, but I really can't say enough about the research that uh, Porter and his team do in this publication. Um, and I understand as, as someone who used to invest 100% of the time in stocks, and you know, anybody who does that, I'm sure knows what I'm talking about. You have some great days and you have some really horrible ones and, you know, substitute the word months and years for days sometimes. You know, the stock market is, uh, is, is a wild ride sometimes. Uh, the bond market generally is not. Uh, it, if, you've, if you've done the research, and look, I'm not, you know, I'm smart enough to follow the research. I'm not smart enough to do it myself. So I'm incredibly grateful uh, that this publication exists. Uh, the bond recommendations come out and uh, generally what's required is patience and the ability to place an online order. And um, I've been able to manage on both of those counts. Wow. Your story just amazes me, Rob. We, we rarely get people who are willing to step forward like this and just tell the whole story from beginning to end. I wish we had more. I hope you inspire more people to come forward. I hope so too. Um, and in fact, it, it's funny because this all really started my involvement with one of the Friday digests. Uh, Porter had just gone on one of his long letters about credit opportunities and what a great program it was and yet how he couldn't sell it. Um, and so you know, at the end, he asked, uh, you know, if anybody's had any good experience with this, could you, you know, feel free to drop me a line? And I did. I said, I can't, I can't imagine anyone who's had a bad experience with it. The only bad experience you could have is no experience at all. I mean, and I get that. Like I said, I used to buy nothing but stocks. Um, and it may be if I hadn't been an Alliance subscriber, I wouldn't have had the courage to say, oh, let me go ahead and try bond research. But I'm so grateful every day that I did. And I would really, I can't say strongly enough, if there are people out there that are on the fence, this is just such a great program. And, uh, and look, not, not every recommendation is, is a winner. That's, that's not a realistic expectation of anybody. But, uh, you know, for, I, I, it was easy for me to respond to that Friday Digest and say, my goodness, my, my, experience with this has been overwhelmingly positive and most importantly, overwhelmingly profitable. So, uh, you know, and so from that, I just, uh, I, that my piece of feedback was received, uh, in Stansbury offices and, uh, somebody reached out to me and said, look, you know, your, your story is an important one to hear. Would you mind telling it? And I thought, my goodness, great. Look, this, I, I'm retired at the age of 52 because largely because of this program and because of the bonds that Porter and his team have been recommending for the last, you know, 10 plus years. Retired at 52. Good night. I'm 57. I'm not retired yet. I'm way behind you, Rob. I need to start <laughs> reading that letter. Well, it's not a bad idea. Dan, your recommendations and uh, credit opportunities, I think are a one, two punch that couldn't be beat. Um, listen, I, I, I'm candid with anyone that asks. I I'm probably will work again because I'm 52 and I can't I can't imagine you know I mean I spent the morning in the garden and that was wonderful but I I don't think that's going to be it for the next 30 40 years God willing <laughs> so I probably will do something but it it's a wonderful feeling not to have to not to have the financial gun to my head and uh, know that I've I've got to start working again or else. So it's, uh, it's, it's just been a very great, liberating feeling. Rob, I have a question for you. It's something I wonder about with a lot of um, our readers, frankly. When they hear the word bonds, they just kind of go right to sleep. They're just not interested. It seems esoteric, and it's just something they dismiss out of hand, you know. And But you didn't do that. You were an Alliance member, and we started delivering you this product, as we promised. But and you went for it. What was the difference? What what was it about this? What appealed to you? Do you remember your state of mind at that time that made you say, you know what, I'm going to try to do this? Well, I was uh, fortunate or unfortunate. I don't even know how to characterize it. Uh, it was 2009, and uh, I had watched my stock portfolio get cleaved by a fair percentage, 
And I was open-minded based purely on that, that, uh, listen, stocks, you know, have seasons like this, and I'm experiencing the second one in the last decade. You know, if there's a better way, I'm open to it. And, uh, you know, so this was really a case of tremendously good timing for me. Now, it might take some of your listeners a little bit more of a push in that, you know, if you're looking at the rearview mirror, the stock market's been doing wonderful work for, you know, (laughs) for everyone's portfolio for the last, I don't know how many years. Um, But having said that, it's, it's not backwards we have to look as investors, it's forward. And anybody who's a reader of any Stansbury publication has to be aware that, you know, we all feel like we're playing the ninth inning of a, of a, of a bull market here. And I don't, I'm not as confident of the next 10 years or the next five or even the next one as I, as I am of what I just saw. So, you know, it may take a little bit more foresight and a little more courage than it took me. Um, you know, I was hip deep in the alligators and I was looking for, for better results. And, you know, and, it, and it's also incredibly helpful. When your first trade goes that well, you start thinking, wow, I'm a genius. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is easy. Um, and, and it's never that easy. And I'm absolutely not a genius, but, uh, but it's made me feel like one most days. And I, I guess the most important thing is I'm off the roller coaster. I mean, I still have stock investments, of course. Um, but when I'm looking to put new money to work right now, I'm, I'm looking at the credit opportunities portfolio first, uh, because I just, I have that degree of confidence that it's, it's going to work out as it's, uh, you know, as it's advertised and as it's been researched. Wow. That is so cool. You know, Porter, he, he worked so hard to try to convince people to do this because he's been around the block a few times. He knows how people behave in the stock market. He knows what kind of results people get. Even if the results of the newsletter are really great, people tend to sort of buy higher and, you know, sell lower. Uh, They get scared and stuff. And he has always had this idea. He's always known that, you know, bonds, especially the high yield bonds, were potentially a much better bet for most people. And I'm glad he found a way to communicate that in the digest and I'm really glad that somebody did it. <laughs> Congratulations to you, Rob. Thank you very much. And I, I got to tell you, I've, I've, you know, I've shared his frustration because I've been reading, like I said, for the better part of 10 years, every time he tries to sell this thing, uh, you know, he, he talks about how difficult it is. And, uh, and it, it stuns me because I... I mean, I I can point to any one of a dozen, maybe 15, maybe 20 trades over the last several years, any one of which would pay the price of the subscription. Uh, So it's, you know, it, like I said, it it does require a certain degree of patience uh, because, you know, bonds are not IPOs. They're not going to pop overnight uh, or they rarely do. Um, It's fun when they do. I'm not going to lie, but it's not my expectation day to day. Uh, but my, my, the bond portfolio that I have, and right now I have a, a portfolio of about eight or nine different issues. Um, it's meeting my expectations and then some, I, I, I can't begin to describe it. <laughs> yeah. And what most folks don't realize is that the, it's much more likely that the bond will get paid than that the stock will do well. And generally speaking, equity is a riskier instrument than debt. Generally speaking. Yeah. And that, that's something that I, um, I've, I've come to embrace, but uh, I mean, I, I, in fairness, I probably can't mention any individual recommendations, but there have been a couple where I've, I've, it's made me do a double take. And I've said one very recently, in fact, I said, wait, you want me to buy the bonds of this company <laughs> when we don't know it's going to be around in three, four, five, ten 10 years. But as you said, Buying a bond is not about that. Buying a bond has all these legal protections built in. And, you know, if, God forbid, the company does go belly up, then here you are as a bondholder at, at or near the front of the line to get paid back. And that's one, another one of the things, Dan, if I can go on another minute. Credit Opportunities has always impressed me because when they recommend a bond, 
of course, they recommend the best case scenario. And the best case scenario is always, you're going to get your $1,000 and you're going to get this much interest. And it's laid out in this chart. So you know down to the penny exactly what your return is going to be in the most likely outcome. But they also take a minute or two and say, on the other hand, maybe we're wrong. Maybe the company is actually going to go bankrupt. And maybe this is going to happen instead. And so they lay out a worst case scenario for you as well. So I sit there and I can make an, an investment choice based on it's likely I'm going to get X percent, but in the case that the company does go bankrupt, well, at least I can realistically expect 30, 40, 50, 60 cents on the dollar, whatever the case may be. But these things are all laid out. And again, I, I feel a little more fluent in the language of bond buying and bond trading now, but I didn't have to when I made my first order. It was, here's the symbol of the bond you want. Here's what you're going to tell the person if you're speaking to them, or here's what you're going to enter if you're doing it on an online order. And it just, it just happened that naturally. But I, I really liked that it's not, you know, uh, the write-ups are not, listen, we are gods and we're, we're right about everything. And so this is how brilliantly you're going to do. You get the flip side too. Here's what you want to do. You know, here, here's what could happen. And, and I like that. I, I appreciate the, the integrity of the publication that way. Yeah, and that's a basic level of thinking for investors. You know, you have to consider various outcomes. And it is really nice that they sort of do some of that work for you and show you. And then you can learn how to think that way from reading the publication, right? Yeah, absolutely. And again, I don't, I don't have the databases that uh, Porter and his team have at my disposal. Um, you know, my understanding is he spent an ungodly amount of money putting it together. And I don't have that kind of scratch, but I don't need it. Um, it's, it's, it's good enough for me to be able to follow the logic and the thinking and the research of a team that really has its act together. And, uh, and again, I think because of the way the market, we're expecting these things in the market to go south soon. Um, I think one of the things that I'm almost excited about is if that does happen, it's actually going to create greater opportunities, uh, not, not fewer. Uh, at least in this one slice of the market. And, uh, you know, so I think, you know, it's a great strategy just about any time, but I really feel like it's best days are ahead of us. And, uh, you know, again, I, I just, I can't say enough about it. Well, Rob, I usually finish these things up by asking someone, our, you know, our interview guests, what they would like to leave our listeners with. If there's one thought that they could leave our listener with, what would it be? Um, all I can, I, I can only reemphasize everything I've said, which is this may be a new experience for you. If so, I understand the trepidation, but really take a chance. Um, it's the, the, the track record of the publication is there in black and white, and it's, it's just as impressive as can be. If you feel like you don't know what you're doing, this publication practically takes you by the hand not in a condescending way either. I mean, I've never been spoken down to or written down to, whatever the case may be, but they'll take you by the hand and say, here's what you have to do. Eventually, when you're more comfortable with it like me, you know, then you can cut right to the chase and say, okay, here's what I want to do. Here's, here's how we're going to do it. There's my downside. I'm willing to live with that. Let's go. But I guess that's, you know, maybe, maybe that's my takeaway message is let's go. Just do this thing because even if you – still are an active stock investor. Uh, I know Porter likes to say, if you do this kind of investing, you'll never buy stocks again. That hasn't been my experience. I still like to invest in stocks. Um, but uh, you'll be a much better, more successful investor, the larger a part of your investing this strategy becomes. Okay. Wow. That was great. Thank you, Rob. And thank you on behalf of um, all the listeners and readers that I think you're helping. And uh, on behalf of everybody at Stansberry. Thank you very much, Dan. Thanks for the opportunity to say this. I really, I do feel like this is, this is a helpful thing for just about everybody. And I, you know, I, I hope as many people as possible can take advantage of it. Yeah, we have a special website that our listeners can go to. It's called investorhoursco.com. And you can go there and learn more about everything that Rob has been talking to you about for the past several minutes. So thanks very much, Rob. And I hope you and I will talk again soon. I hope so, Dan. Thanks very much.
You bet. Bye-bye. Okay, everybody, that concludes another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. And you can go to our website, www.investorhour.com, and you can sign up and put your email in and get all the updates. And there's transcripts there for every episode. Just click on the episode you want, scroll down to the bottom, and the transcript will be there. You can also go to Investor Hour SCO, investorhoursco.com, and you can learn all about Stansberry credit opportunities, which our second guest, Rob Lamoureux, was talking about today. Okay, so talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to investorhour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email at feedback at investorhour.com. This broadcast is provided for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network.